Hi, and welcome to Chess for Life in the time of the coronavirus. Today we have a grandmaster who needs no introduction. It is English grandmaster Peter Wells. Uh, he has been a um, British junior champion on three occasions. He has written many books, including some great books on the Semislav and the Tronkovsky. And he has been, he's worked with the England team and he has coached uh, second of Joel Lautier, Michael Adams and Luke McShane. His most recent book, which he'll be telling us about shortly, is called Chess Improvement. It's all in the mindset. Uh, and he's also um, works on the Accelerator program, which he'll also tell us more about in a minute. Peter Wells, welcome to the program. Thanks very much, Natasha. Nice to be here. And Matthew? Yeah. Can you start off by telling us a little bit about your chess career and how you got into playing chess? Well, I, I was one of those, I was one of these sort of group of people who learned it about the age of six, which I think is not uncommon among people who took chess quite a long way. I, it, none, of my, none of my parents really played at all. Um, I had an aunt came over who, the visitors from New Zealand, who bought our, my first chess set. Oh. And as far as I remember, she knew enough to kind of teach me the rules. But I remember, I remember a little bit of a time lag where we had this chess set there, and, and, and my mum does seem to have this idea that it was very difficult. <laughs> and you know, as we all know, it's quite a difficult game to play well, but it's not that easy. To, sorry, not that difficult to play at all. And I think I was a little put off at first from even finding rules. Then when we did learn the rules, I thought, I, you know, that was surprisingly okay. And I think. Um, I think probably the most important thing in my early years was that I had a friend um, who also became very interested mm. um, and the two of us were kind of sparring off each other, um, you know, friendly rivalry for quite a number of years. And yeah. also together with that was a pretty active thriving junior scene in Portsmouth and Hampshire as well. Yeah. So in those yeah. senses I was quite lucky, but there was very little by way of formal coaching at that time. Did your friend continue to play chess? No. Did your friend continue to play chess? No, so my friend got to, I don't know, he, he, if he's listening, he probably won't like however I describe it. I think he got to kind of 180-ish. Okay, like yeah, yeah, great, yeah. He's gone play at, at, at quite You're going to give him a name check? But Ian Welch. Oh, yes, okay. And he, well, I mean, I remember as a, as a young junior, he was very, very theoretical. I remember sitting next to him in a simultaneous playing Paul Littlewood once. Mm. And, um, you know, I was getting sort of squeezed in some advanced French or something, and he was on move 25 of the poison <laughs> <laughs> you know, He was one of those guys who took his learning very, very seriously. And that was, that was, you know, I think for a while I kind of played along with that a bit, and he would bash me up in theory now and again. Now and, again. and then one of these local mentors at some point said, you know, you actually quite good. <laughs> he suggested that I might actually be a little bit better than he was, and that if I stopped playing all the stereo, I might stop getting bashed up. And that was a very helpful piece of advice, which I took. And and then I started to move ahead with him a little bit, but we played on for, you know, we, we went to London for tournaments, staying together, that sort of thing, for some years. But I think he gave up, I can't remember, mid to late teens. Yeah. Okay, yeah. 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 As many people do, of course. Yeah. And you you went to Oxford University? Go to Oxford University, yeah. Yeah, and you weren't a mathematician. I know many chess players are mathematicians, but yeah, you weren't a mathematician. I don't know, but also not, aren't they? I mean, in, in my time, there was James Howell, who was a linguist, and there were... I'm stopping now thinking of the other non but there were others. I Dave think. Norwood, is, he wasn't a mathematician. David Norwood. History, I think. History, History I think. History, yeah. 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 Um, and yeah, that, I mean, of course, there were a lot of mathematicians. There were a lot of, you know, incredibly strong at Oxford when I was there. There were, there were just off the top of my head, um, Jonathan Levitt, um, Colin McNabb, David Cummings, Ken Regan was there. All these guys were there at a similar kind of time. So, uh, John Hawksworth, who yeah. of course was, the input, was a very strong player. So it was quite a, you know, it was a good chess environment at Oxford as well. Mm. Although I think, you know, the time I was in Oxford itself, I didn't, in fact, play that much chess. Yeah. Oh, okay. You were more into your studies. I was quite into my studies for a time, yes. Really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was more into my studies.
funny at that point. But you know, um, then I then I started to do a PhD, but kind of it didn't work. I didn't basically get the right subject, um, and after about six months or so, I decided to to, to cut my losses and, and get out of that. And I think at that point, moving into chess for a time felt like a bit of a liberation. Like yeah. Experience. Yeah. Um, and as people always say, and I think just about everybody says, they didn't go into chess expecting to be there 10 years later or 20, 30 years later. Yeah. They expected to be doing it for a short time, but somehow it has, you know, there's a lot to like about the chess life and it has a way of sucking you in at some point. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, um, and well, what, what about writing? How do you find chess writing? Do you enjoy that? How do I find it? Um, I still enjoy it. I mean, okay, I started, my early opening books were kind of before the age of the engine. Hmm. And in that time, they were substantially more difficult than they are now, I think. You know, you had to yeah. make the, I mean, okay, I think working with an engine is a very interesting thing as well. I'm, I'm, not, I'm quite interested in the whole process of how the human brain tracks with, with, with the computer. But, um, you know, back in those days, you had to make a lot of very tricky judgment calls about which lines were good, yeah, a lot of assessments where yeah, you had no yeah. And, you know, the semi slav book, which you were kind enough to mention in the, in the introduction, was from that period. And, yeah, it was quite a, it was a, quite a tough slog. So in terms of, you know, as a piece of employment, it's pretty catastrophic. <laughs> 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 Hundreds of hours and then receive a, yes. a rather minimal paycheck. So you kind of have to enjoy it on some level. And I remember while, well, soon after I finished this book, I was playing the semi slav and basically the time I was writing it, my results weren't very good and I'm getting shipped discouraged by this. Then when it came out, uh, the results improved a lot. I presume yeah. the people were reading it and believing it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know. But you left these little gaps, did you? <laughs> it took a while to get into the kind of yeah. culture of the opening. I think, you know, for a while I was playing it because I was writing about it and I think you have to play it because you're loving it. Yeah, yeah. But you know, and I, I, I'd like to, then I then I moved away from these very ultra theoretical books, and I think things like the Scotch, which I really liked a lot. I thought the Scotch was a, a tad neglect. I really enjoyed that one. And then the Tromposky laser. These were much less heavy theoretical books and much more conceptual. Yeah. And that's a that's a good deal more fun, I think. Yeah, because yeah. you, you wrote some books. You wrote some books for Gambit as well, didn't you? The, the Queen's Indian and uh, and the I, I like these very much actually. Yeah. So keen on the character. No, the, the Queen's Indian one was was very good. They were very well received. I mean, yeah. yeah um, again, they were quite conceptual in nature, but there was plenty of chunky analysis as well. Um, but after that, I was originally due to write more than just those two. After those two, I kind of got a bit fed up with writing just opening books. Mm. Because you put all this effort in, and they're, they're interesting, and the, the things about them are like. They're a little bit transient. You kind of think that in yeah, 10 years' yeah. time, maybe nobody will. You're going to have to rewrite it. Yeah. And, yeah, and then there will be new books which, whether they're better or not, will will, will be more up to date and therefore more more read. So at that point, I decided I didn't want to write any more pure opening books. I mean, I've just got a commitment for life. But I don't have plans at the moment to write more opening books. And then I started embarking on another project, which unfortunately didn't come to fruition. And then we came to my current project where, you know, I was lucky enough to be invited into a project by a co-author, and then it was, this one is very different to the range. But, but yeah. So, so what's, this, what's this current project then? Well, it's basically, I mean, the, my co-author is, a, or has been a professor of um, educational psychology, and his, his specialism, or one of his specialisms is mindset. Mm. Um, mindset theory, and he, he actually, I mean, he's a big figure in the UK in mindset terms. He knew the originator of mindset theory. He's kind of poured with her that kind of mindset thing. So he's he's right up there in the mindset thing. And I'd I'd actually come across these theories um, maybe three, two or three years I don't remember exactly before I met him. So when I met him, I was quite you know we had quite an interesting conversation about this stuff. Mm. And I was I was really rather impressed by it because as as may not be a tremendous secret to some people, some of my chess career has probably been held back by one or two psychological issues. Certainly. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to maintain a straight face, but you, you just stopped me. Um, you know, the failure to overcome time problem is obviously, you know, the closest I will ever have to a legend, but 
um, you know, there've been other other aspects too. I think I've you know had periods where I got very nervous in winning positions, that kind of mm. thing. Um, many many psychological issues. So you know, I kind of approach this book. Well, I have to believe passionately in the chapter about learning from failure, and, <laughs> and that you know these experiences actually, you know, so, some people might say this guy has no idea about psychology. Why am I reading this? But I think that you know the thing where you actually do learn from a number of um, unpleasant experiences, and I think. In that sense, I really have learned, mm. and this theory made a lot of sense to me. Um, you know, like most theories, you get extremists and moderates. <laughs> and, yes. and, and Bar uh, Barry, my co-author, I was delighted to discover fairly on in the project is in some ways a moderate. You know, for yeah. example, I mean, just, yes, do you know what the essential mindset theory is about? Go on, um, you give us the overview because okay, our line. listeners might not know. There's a one-liner, I suppose. Um, what you believe about the possibility of improvement is one of the biggest determinants in how much you're going to improve. It's As in that you believe you can improve? Yeah, the, the fact that you don't believe that, that there is a very fixed level caused by something called talent, which you can't really get behind, and yeah. you know, the belief that if you work, and work in the right way, and learn mm. from defeats, and take feedback, and all those kind of things. Is that because you, you keep on trying, basically? Um, well, keeping on trying is part of it, but sort of keeping on trying and failing isn't a lot of fun. Yeah. I think, you know, but it, it's, you know, some people basically believe that, you know, the, that some people are talented and some people are not, and however yeah. hard the ones who are not try, yeah. they're never going to make it. You know, we've yeah. all worked with people who give the impression that things come to them relatively easily. Yeah. But I don't think there are really people where it comes from, you know, some magical place at the beginning. You know, yeah. Mozart had an awful lot of acquired knowledge and acquired experience. Yeah, because we're all told to say to our kids, well done for working hard and sticking at it, as opposed to saying, well done for getting the top mark. That's right, and I think that's very good advice. This is obviously one of the things that's just discussed in the book. I mean, I think the, the whole area of, you know, not praising your children for kind of being something rather than for doing or for working yeah. hard, that, I think that's one of the areas where the theory can be quite counterintuitive. Yeah, so yeah. It's not so common sense. So any of these theories, some of what you're saying comes across as quite common sense. I think. Mm. But I think the praise thing is quite a, quite a challenging area for some people. But basically, I think, um, well, you'll have, to, you'll have to wait and see the book. <laughs> but yeah. I, think we, I think the case is pretty strong. Um, yeah. For and so, yeah. So what's what's your what's then been your approach? Have you applied it to your time trouble? Well, I've tried. Come on, the second I'm fifty-five. <laughs> As you know from your yeah. own. What I mean is, what's the technique? What's what's the technique to? So I, you know, we I'm sure we all have our own, not not necessarily time trouble, but some kind of psychological things we want to improve. Well, I think pretty. I mean, with time trouble, a pretty good start is to figure out why you're getting into time trouble. Yeah. It seems to me, I mean, I, I, it, you know, I would glibly say for many years that it's perfectionism, and I'm sure that it is. But I think there are, you know, at least two very distinct types of perfectionism. One yes. of them is kind of um, a genuine kind of intellectual curiosity and interest in finding yeah. the very best way. And another one is basic a kind of nervousness about being caught out. Yeah. But, you know, and I think one of, one of the things which mindset is very strong on, if you stop thinking in terms of a sort of fixed level of talent, then it's much easier to stop thinking in terms of, you know, am I going to be found out? Am I, you know, is this something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But mm. when you've got that, then I think it's much easier to address, you know, that side. And I think, you know, the, the intellectual curiosity thing is not, in principle, something to be discouraged as long as you're not doing yeah. it yeah, yeah, yeah. 50 minutes at a time during a game. But the other one, I think that distinguishing those two is very helpful. The other one, I think, is absolutely catastrophic. And I think mm. in general, when you're trying to show people how good you are, or you're trying mm. to, you know, you're concentrating on winning things rather than on learning. I mean, the absolute essence of all this is, is the concentration on learning rather than on sort of outward achievement. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I don't know, I mean, yeah, what the specific technique is tricky, but I think an awareness of those things is quite useful. Mm. So I yeah. try to... You know, I've tried to curtail the intellectual curiosity, and yeah. I certainly, even more than that, tried to curtail the, I mean, the extreme intellectual curiosity, a bit of it, probably. Yeah. But I also tried to curtail the definite, you know, sort of nervousness about how I'm going to be perceived, I suppose. 
think that's the act of Gillen yeah. again, Jeff. Yeah. When you start yeah. thinking, how is somebody going to think about my move? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, playing what you want to be playing, right? I think, yeah. I think something like that popped up in the interview I did with you as well, Matthew. Yeah. yeah. This is really important. And, you know, it's no doubt in my mind that the very worst moments of my Ted career, some kind of bit has always been going on about how will I be perceived at this point. And thank yeah. you. Okay. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And how would you describe your chess style? Um. Well, I think I'm, I'm, I'm a bit of a hacker. Oh, <laughs> I'm going to think I'm a bit of an animal, but I also, you know, I think I have a reasonably, I think I have quite a strong positional grounding. But yeah. I think on my psychological problems, I have a little bit of fear that my technique isn't quite adequate. Okay. I've you know, played some nice attacking games. I've got some, um, yeah, and some, so actually some of the end games haven't been that bad, but that ties in very badly with the time goal. I think I don't have, I was talking to somebody about this today, I think what I don't have is a very good instinct at speed in the ending. Yeah. Because someone like Keith was saying he could just go onto autopilot. He played, like, he's a component and right? He's yeah. played so many of them. He can just, yeah. uh, he just knows what to do and he doesn't have to think too hard and he just, uh, uh, can kind of switch on his rook and forward end game brain and and, well, and he's away. Uh, what he said, I thought was one of the interesting bits was that he said he hadn't studied the ending. Yes. The ending. Yes. Yeah. Quietly raised his eyebrow. Yeah. Good. Yeah. No, it's a. Uh, but I think yeah. I mean, learning. Yeah, learning by learning by playing and if you've got a um yeah playing, and if you've got a um yeah if, if it appeals to you somehow then you just uh yeah you know sometimes things just uh you start off with a with a good basis by accident even maybe uh, can happen and then things just you know more and more things just slot into place properly somehow i don't know it's uh so it's but to yeah to kind of check what you've played against what is mm. supposed to be the truth yeah no, it's interesting if you really did study them yeah no, it's, uh, but I recognise the thing about um, uh, having good instinct or um, at, at speed in end games because uh, obviously that's one of the things that Magnus Carlsen is so impressive in. You know, just this beautiful feel for where the pieces go. You know, even in these blitz games, you see some of the endings. And uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, I always feel I'm you know, I'm a decent end game player, but I do need time just to you know to to think it through and uh, and uh, and plan it through. And uh, you know, playing end games of blitz is is quite tough, I find. <laughs> I think when I'm playing well, I have quite a good feel for where things go in the middle game. Yeah, but for yeah. some reason, when the pieces are coming off, that, that feel kind of isn't there anymore in the same yeah. way. You know, then it really needs to be thought about much more. So, <clears throat> so I've done the complete opposite of what I should have done. By that logic, I should have reserved time for the end game. <laughs> and as may be well known, that's not what's happening. Yeah, so if, I, I do wonder as well whether if you get into time trouble a lot, the uh, the sort of endings that you get are often quite random. Um, you know, that it's, it's uh, you never get you never the game's never progressing quite normally, but there's some sort of hiatus in the middle, and then afterwards, you know, the end game and the pawn structure has been ruined, you know, because you've you've, you've done all sorts of things there, you know. Whereas, um, um, yeah, but I, I mean, because I, I got into time trouble quite a lot, you know, when I was um, when I was younger, and uh, well, towards the end of my professional career, I got a bit better, and uh, so I, I sort of noticed that somehow, or I had the feeling anyway, that you know, positions after move forty were a little bit more normal. I was getting you know more normal positions my pawn structure was still vaguely intact and that somehow that makes endings easier as well you know they're they're uh, a lot more standard somehow not so random but uh it's uh... in terms of things being practice it occurred to me that i actually have relatively little practice in mm. playing end games under normal conditions yeah yeah yeah, yeah. So almost all my end game practice is at speed yeah yeah <laughs> so the number of hours you've spent playing end games must be quite small <laughs> Well, I think I also it's have compressed into about three minutes. Another thing which noted, when I noticed about people like Luke and David mm. um, is that they play incredibly long games. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Luke, we, we mentioned this in the book, actually, I don't want to mention this in the book, yeah, but we, we, we mentioned in the book that, you know, one of, I remember Jonathan Ralston saying, and, and I, it completely resonated with me at the time, that one of Luke's strengths is that he thinks he just enjoys sitting at the board more than most other people. Mm. And therefore these 140 move games and things, that is, is, is absolutely comfortable with that. Whereas I think a lot of people are, you know, sort of pretty, pretty easy to get away by about 70. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I think that's great. And I noticed David as well. I think I looked at the two of them. They both had, at their tender ages, about 10 or more games, which were longer than my longest game. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. That's yeah. a fairly significant thing. That's actually outrageous. Which actually, yeah. you know, I think that probably does show that you like chess, doesn't it? 
Because you, you might have agreed a draw or given up <laughs> way earlier if you. If you were... I think I quite like chess too, but it doesn't sort of. You know, yeah. Doesn't mean I'm happy to sit there all day long. I, maybe I'm just lazy. I haven't really occurred to me that until I saw this. But I, it's, a, it's a horrifying thought. But it's a very interesting feature about. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. And, and when you when you do your you you you've seconded a number of players and you you you've done a lot of coaching. How what's your focus when you do that? Are you are you quite into mindset uh, in regards to coaching, or are you more on the techniques and the openings? What what? Well, what I think when I was um, when I was uh, working with you know the people I'm, that we mentioned before, Luke and Mickey and, and those guys, I, I didn't have any knowledge of mindset at that point. You know. Yeah. That's all come since then. Uh, my role now, my role now with the accelerator is a little bit different because I'm not, I'm not there principally as a coach. I'm supposed to be a, a more broader mentor, you know, the mentor okay. role rather yeah. than just a coaching role. So yeah. then it's very natural and works very, very well actually in tandem with what I've been writing to bring in these other things. Uh, so yes, I'm thinking very much about mindset. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm getting some chance in a way, and yeah. see. And how are players responding to that? Well, I'd say a mixture. I'd say some are responding quite well. Others uh, are probably slightly more baffled by the message. <laughs> and, 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 and I think that, no, I mean, they, you know, they're, they're responding fine, but some of them are quite young, and it's, it's yeah. really quite a comp. You know, what, part of what I'm trying to do, and part of what I think is one of the keys uh, that mindset theory reveals, is, is, you know, thinking about the way you're working is an incredibly important, you know, kind yeah. of work without much thought behind it is often quite wasted, I think. Yeah, yeah. Then, yeah. Well, I remember Nigel saying to me many years ago that, you know, he thought thousands and thousands of hours were spent by people working on chess who actually had no idea how to go about it. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, that's a little yeah. bit rough because Nigel was not always um, keen to shy away from controversy, but it's it's probably true, isn't it? There's, there's a yeah. lot of yeah. time has been spent not working particularly efficiently on chess. So, one of my main aims with the accelerator is to try to get people working as efficiently as possible and to think about, you know, think about what they're learning from things. So, I mean, yeah. this partly went back to the interview I had with Matthew, where he was, and, and with Luke as well, who had a very similar reinforcing message, which was that one of the most important things to do is obviously to analyze your own games, but to analyze them in a particular way where you're thinking very much about your feelings and your emotions as well as, yeah. you know, okay. as well as in a very technical scientific way. And that was, for me, one of the most interesting things I learned during the whole sort of process of writing the book, and I've des definitely very strongly been trying to put that into practice yeah. with the accelerator. So everyone yeah. on the accelerator writes notes to their games, whether they like it or not. <laughs> yeah. they, and this Do they're very of, aware of their own feelings as well, well as their own... That's, that's the aim. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, at different ages, some of them very much so, but they're getting, you know, they're being much more self-critical in that sense. Not yeah. in a, just a negative sense, but, you know, yeah. self-analytical. And I think yeah. that's that's pretty handy. I mean, it, I guess it could be overdone, but I think it's a pretty useful, useful yeah. thing to try yeah. and still. Absolutely. I mean, for me, that... It's part of what I'm trying to still. Yeah. I mean, for me, that was really that was really a huge thing, you know, that uh, to reflect about, you know, what I was thinking and uh, and how I was thinking and what I was feeling during uh, during the games and uh, you know trying to and also you know yeah even yeah I don't know yeah preparing new openings that so you try and think oh how am I going to feel you know about this new opening and uh, what sort of you know feelings can I have about it you know can I fall in love with a Nidorf or something like that so just very very important to have a, a human approach to uh, to your games. I've had that experience as well where you. You, you prepare an opening and then you get to the board and it all feels very different. Yeah, it feels cold. Really, you think, oh, God, yeah, all these variations, you know, my goodness, yeah. you know, no feelings about it at all. Yeah. I remember it at the board, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's... <laughs> that's another thing, because the... Yeah, somehow the, you don't get that familiarity just by studying. You need no. to play as well. Yeah. And, but you required terrific yeah yeah it's true it's true but i mean i, I do regret somehow that i didn't um uh, yeah i regret that i was that i stayed very narrow as a professional you know and didn't uh, broaden out but on the other hand you know i got so so in love with the queen's gambit accepted the nidorf and uh, and my d4 repertory you know with my uh, e3 against the semi slav and all, all this sort of stuff you know that that it really i felt it gave me you know because i didn't i didn't work with anyone else so in some ways, it's a big, you know, big, big thing that I missed, really. Um, you know, most of my work that I did, apart from when I was seconding uh, a few players, uh, you know, it was all on my own. Um, and in some ways, you know, I, I think I'm, I really missed a, a chance to broaden myself out. 
on the other hand, it gives you this huge monolithic power, really, you know, because uh, because it's you, it's you against the world. You know, no one, uh, no one uh, can uh, can take that away from you. If you win, it's your victory, you know, and uh, and somehow that, uh, you know, I don't see myself as ultra competitive, but somehow that was obviously, you know, really that was really what I loved about um... looking molded into a conspiracy theory. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, but uh, yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's uh, but I think, yeah, I mean, obviously in general, so I think, you know, working together with someone else is also uh, what John M said, you know, he said he worked a lot, obviously, with Chris Ward when they were sharing a flat and uh, that, that helped them enormously when they were chasing the gem title. And I'm, I'm sure must must have been, uh, must have been brilliant. And uh, it's, uh, yeah, yeah. Did, did... I've mainly worked for people rather than working with them so much. Okay, yeah, yeah. Also, those those were good. I, I've had those kind of good working relationships. You know, you definitely learn quite a lot. And I think, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I had when when I worked with uh, with Joel Lutier, You know, I mean, remember these great times when uh, you know you're 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 about to face, he's about to face Kasparov tomorrow, and uh, you know he sends you away for the night, and uh, it's you nine hours, and you know something to break one of Gary's lines. You know, I mean, it's a great, uh, especially the pre-computer age. You know, because uh, that was the especially the thing. You know, then it's got a certain romance and drama about it. You know, it's. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, there. yeah, yeah. I love that too. Yeah, yeah. yeah you were much closer to being. <laughs> yeah, great. but not quite. But it's not quite. You know, just uh, always, always, uh, always just below. So now it was gorgeous. I mean, it was really, really. I, I had, a, I had a great time. It's. Uh, but the funny thing is, you know, just talking about, you know, the approach that you have with players and how it can vary. Um, uh, with Joël Lutier, we were both, you know, work lunatics. And somehow that worked really, really well. And then uh, at one time I seconded uh, Jeroen Piquet, you know, who's an uh, absolutely lovely guy, uh, really, you know, really, uh, really great guy. But uh, but he was he would have needed somebody really who was into the um, um, yeah the, the the positive reinforcement and uh, you know the, the warm skills and uh, getting him ready for the game, putting him in a good mood. And and I was kind of I was trying, but you know I was much more for of oh, the like this variation. You know, it's just uh, and that was um, yeah that that was uh, emotional intelligence. Exactly, exactly. And uh, certainly when I was when I was young, I was I was uh, I think certainly variable, very variable. Well, I don't know how I am now, but I mean. Uh, you know, just very, certainly very variable on that. Certainly, having a normal job and working, you do notice uh, people a lot more, really, than, than when you're a chess player, I have to say. And have you ever tried, to, have you ever done anything on the senior circuit, Pete? No, I haven't, no. Does um, it appear to or not? I don't know whether I'm just in denial. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, um, I have, oh, I, I will do it at some point, but I haven't. I mean, actually, you know, the accelerator's taken a lot, the accelerator and the book together have taken yeah. a huge amount of time in yeah. the last couple of years. Yeah. And slightly annoyingly, I was planning to play a little bit more in this period. How has coronavirus affected you? We're, we're, we're 17th of June now, 2020. Okay, so... So it's um, been about three months in lockdown. It's been about three months in lockdown. It's, well, it's affected me in various ways. I mean, okay, so the accelerator work has managed to continue, but it changed its nature. You know, it's, I've been giving, uh, trying to give a lot more sort of written work and feedback on a written basis. Because at the time, before the um, lockdown, I was actually attended to uh, traveling to people's houses and seeing them face to face. Okay. I yeah. doing so much work on Skype, which is a pretty heavy traveling commitment. But I think in many ways, particularly when you're trying to, uh, you're trying to do mentoring rather than coaching. Yeah, yeah worth it because you need that extra if you're just coaching maybe but for a proper mentoring role it seems to me that's quite tough to do at distance so um so that's changed radically i mean obviously i'm um, a parent of two children one of whom is normally at school and so that's uh, that's uh, another interesting challenge i mean yeah, i'm very lucky because well she's nine years old and she is very enthusiastic about her schoolwork and, and very very capable as well, so she's actually pretty self-motivated to, to get on with the work. Okay, we, yeah. We spend quite a bit of time supporting her when she wants us to, but you know she can get on with it by herself. And you you hear about these people who, you know, it's a constant struggle to try and get their kids to work. That must be mm. fairly, well, a bit of a nightmare. So I'm very glad to be. <laughs> it's not like that. Um, the little one is three, and she is. 
she will tell you all about the virus if you ask. <laughs> it's very important to keep two distances away. <laughs> Um, and she's very good if we if we go out for a walk or something. If she sees somebody, she'll sort of run a little bit like they're about to attack us all or something. If she needs to keep her distance. In the last week, she seems to have acquired the um, the theory that Boris Johnson brought the virus and is to blame for the whole thing. It's a bit harsh, but it's, uh, <laughs> it didn't come from us. <laughs> she didn't get up so um, yeah, she's she's coping very well. I mean, she's at home a lot anyway, but she goes kind of a couple of days a week to a child mind and I think she's missing that and she's missing she's missing going to see a bunch of friends and she's, yeah yeah she's asking us when the virus will be over from that point of view but you know it's, it's I think compared to the situation many parents are we're very lucky and I think the biggest variable of all is probably having an outdoor space you know having a having a decent sized garden yeah. I don't know yeah. really how how we would cope if we had a garden during that, yeah. that really fine lockdown period you know when you couldn't go out yeah yeah. Um, I mean, personally, I've been pretty cautious because, well, I have some asthma, and last year I had uh, a sort of blood, blood clotting problem as well, which okay, yeah, you know, has some links. To, so you know, I, I, I don't think my, I don't think my prognosis if I got it would be that terrible. But you know, the chance yeah, I got it. Better, you'd rather not. So I'm a male in my fifties, and that's not a great start. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, it's so there's plenty of reasons that I want to be quite cautious. Yeah. So you know, now we have some decisions to make about how, how quickly. Yeah, yeah. Quickly yeah. But you know, in, uh, obviously I wanted to play, which I can't do, and all the other things. I, I'm missing that, although I did play mm -hmm. online a couple of times in the last couple of weeks. Yeah, um, yeah it's been it's, it's been tough, but I'm very conscious that it's, it's been a lot tougher for other people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Been yeah. Relatively lucky, actually. Yeah, yeah. 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 Did just how did you find how, how did you find online playing? Sorry, just one. Did, uh, uh, well, I'm really I, I'm one of those people who've never really played online blitz. Yeah, and I don't even have a very good mouse. So, oh, yeah. um, the first yeah, I'm, it's Lee Chess. So John Ems told me the, uh, quite rightly that the important thing is to set up confirm moves. <laughs> yeah. So, so you have the possibility to to deal with finger slips. So I would have lost horribly yesterday due to a finger slip if, without that superb advice. So okay. <laughs> to him. Um, I find it a bit odd. Yeah. Uh, the, well, I've played two games, and the first one I, I, I found very odd at first, because mm. it was the first one. But I think I got quite into it, actually. Okay. About, uh, and I actually got into a little bit of time trouble and managed to speed up quite a lot and handled it okay. And that kind of felt... That was quite nice. That felt briefly like proper playing chess. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, but yesterday I got into time trouble and it was uh, completely clueless. I just couldn't, I could barely sort of administer a move. Secondly, <laughs> 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 I just didn't think he'd gone out if I was playing Blitz. How embarrassing would this be? So, um, but the whole thing, I mean, the atmosphere, I find uh, it's quite difficult to get fully into the atmosphere. Yeah, but yeah, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it was probably slightly better than I expected on the whole. Yeah, and, you know, I'm playing for I'm playing for White Rose, who I've played for for, for more than fifteen years. So mm. it's kind of quite nice to play for yeah. them anyway. Yeah, and, so was, yeah, I quite enjoyed it to be honest. Yeah, but on the other okay. hand, I'm rushing to do it every week. <laughs> <laughs> so but, imagine we're in where you're going into lockdown, and you can take one game with you, uh, a nice game you've played. What game would it be, and why? Um, yeah, okay, I think probably my game from John Ems, uh, with, against John Ems, from back in the days of the Red Bus Knockout. Oh, good Lord, oh. yeah. Yeah, that was, that was quite fun. So, I mean, that was almost, apart from the 1997 World Championship, that was my only experience in my life of playing a knockout event. And I don't think any of my experiences of it were terribly happy because even even the game I'm about to show you did not clip to me the fixture. Oh. <laughs> I managed to lose the game the next day and probably in the afternoon or whatever and then um. you know, get knocked out in the rapids. But um, it, I, it was just, I don't know, it was a, a game I really enjoyed. It was, the tactics all flowed quite nicely and I think it, well, I think it has a bit of flow to it. But I, 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 I most of my best games are attacking games. And I think some of my almost best games are attacking games where something went wrong. <laughs> this one, this one went relatively smoothly, and I think 
But it's, it's basically it contains three sacrifices in one game, and I think that's that's quite good going, and they're all quite kind of cute. So. Okay, very good. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much for the interview, and we are now going to move on to look at the game. Okay, let's have a look at the game. Peter, you started with Knight F3. I did, that's something. I, I, I've been interesting to just to survey how many games start with Knight F3 because people positively want something and how many happen because they're trying to avoid something. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just laughing if I remember what I did, but I'm not sure. So C5. Oh, yeah, John did this all the time, didn't he, uh, at this well, period? It's a good move if people have played one night of three to transpose into things but didn't really mean it. That's, yeah, you know, yeah. That's the way to catch them out if they're really just D4 players trying to avoid stuff. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Could go E4 here. Yeah, no, that I have done as well a few times. Yeah, it's, uh, but you're too late for the Mora Gambit, Natasha. So, uh... Yeah, you don't, do you? You use Mora Gambit these days. It's been known. <laughs> Actually, we, we interviewed uh, uh, Ankush Kandawal uh, yesterday. He's a chess player and, um, um, and also a, well, a huge game specialist. But uh, he turned out to play the Birds and the, uh, the Mora Gambit, and, uh, which are both openings that Natasha plays. So it was, uh, it was a huge... A huge... Yeah, both openings I've written a Trends book about. Exactly. My so... two Trends book are the Birds and the Mora. <laughs> And they're, they're available now. I saw, didn't we see they're, they're available from Amazon for a hundred pounds or something like that now? We can still, uh, can still get them. Yeah, it's, bargain. Uh, bargain. <laughs> anyway, John went knight c6, knight c3, and g6. Yeah, this is interesting. I mean, when I was a kid, I think, I think, I think, I think, I think, I think, I used to have the feeling that this move order wasn't quite right. Because, you know, it's basically because black gets forced into the stuff which I pretty much forced on into in the game. But over the years, I think my opinion of black position has probably improved and improved to the point where now I think it's almost certainly kind of okay. We'll see. But I, okay, white can pretty much, pretty much dictate the pattern of the next two moves. Okay, right. Yeah. So, you know, if, 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 white, if black just plays bishop g7 now, d4. Then it's a little difficult. Black's going to end up allowing d5, and basically the knight on c6 would be a little bit different. Yeah, yeah. And it's yeah, it should be should be a bit better for um, for. Uh... Certainly, black has to go into something a bit like a, a panel attack in the Caracano. And again, it's at least arguable that knight on c6 is a bit misplaced. Yeah, yeah. The is that it's only a bit misplaced. So he, and this is what you did. Yeah, d4 takes yeah, takes. And D five. Yeah. And okay, I mean, yeah, there were there were a couple of moves here. Bishop D five is, is another relatively challenging thing, but I, I, I don't. I mean, I, at the time, I just I remember preparing several things tonight before this game. It was just one of them, and I, I just made the decision to play C takes D five and stuff which I knew a bit about. I, I didn't know what John would have done against Bishop D five. Okay, right, yeah. It's uh, because he'd had a game with this with with Black already, hadn't he? Against against Steve Giddings, actually. That's right. Yes, against Steve. So it's. Uh, uh, which. At the time, I knew how that was gone, but I don't recall now. Yeah, no, I think uh, I think we've we've got it in the notes somewhere. So. Okay, so my big idea is that you force Black to make some sense. Yeah, if you just take that, if Black can play Bishop G seven and Carlson, he's very comfortable. This move is. Black to do something about F7, and if Black has to play E6, it doesn't in some ways fit terribly well with, with the G6. Ah, okay, so that's why he goes Knight D5. Yeah, by the way, if they, they, now they've just started, we're, we're past the moment, but they've started not even bothering to take off D3. Oh, really? And, uh, after Queen B3, they just go E6 now. Oh, good lord. Okay. They just say, you know, show me. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, how si actually, how simple. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, that, was, that was too complex for the time. We didn't think of that. Then. <laughs> so, yeah, so they take on C3, they hit C4, and then, you know, the main line then was probably E6. Okay. So it, it, it just, uh, you know, Black needs to do something about Black. 
that was this was around about the time when Black started moving from E6 to like D5 is the main move, I think. But okay, yeah, yeah. Was, was very much the thing. But you know, clearly White has ideas of just obey three whenever Black goes to G7, and that's the thing, and, and we'll keep some initiative and just say something. Yeah, yeah, this is always. Uh... Always looking dangerous. So they went knight d5 to uh, avoid giving you that b takes c3. Takes and e6. Yeah. And well, I have to take on c6. Central, otherwise I'm going to drop a d4. Well, I found quite. I, I think I found this position quite interesting because I, I found. I think I like positions with fairly clear cut planning. You know, I think that's one of the big ways that people ought to classify openings that don't necessarily is openings where the plan is kind of there dictated by the structure and ones where you have to work it out for yourself. But in this one it seems to me that, you know, you have certain things which are clear for white, like an extended dark focus is the green and if black can play C five and bring his bishop pair to life then he's gonna have he's gonna have some fun and if he can't then white can, can hope to have kind of slight long term pressure. It seems to me like the idea is a quite clear cut. But actually, they turn out, in some cases, to be quite normal as well. So. Yeah. But I, I, was, I was sort of happy with this position, but this is the one which my opinion has changed about a bit. I remember some years later, when I was working with the Inkton team, I encouraged Nigel to play with Black on my case, when he was sort of quite keen to, he was quite keen to play for a win. And he wanted something with a little bit of imbalance. Okay, so yeah. I showed him this. He didn't seem to know that much about, but he was quite, he was quite enthusiastic. Okay, so, yeah. You know, if, obviously, if Black can get C5 into the right moment, it's going to be quite fun. And, and I think he thought there was enough to play with here in terms of imbalance. So I think from both sides, point of view, it's, it's, it's got interest. That played Queen D5, I think. Which is, That's right. Yeah. <clears throat> and now you played, this was the big move, Bishop F4. Well, I don't know. I mean, I think this is, this is, this has had a, quite a lot of theory ideas. I mean, it's, a, it's a slight, one of the key things for black in this position is that f6 is usually quite a good move, I think. Yeah. Because some of those, you need to start claiming back some of those dark squares. And, you know, I've even seen some games where black plays f6 and manages to attack with g5 or something like that. You can sort of imagine if he gets his pieces moving in that way, it could be well, the So although at the time I played the game, which of f4, I was quite keen on. Since then, moves like bishop g5 to try and hinder f6 have been tried. Which is an interesting thought as well. Yeah, once you understand that how interesting F6 is for Black, yeah, you yeah. start to see more purpose. I remember Yakovenko played that one, and then later just Bishop E3. Oh, with the idea of going Knight D2 very quickly. Okay. I suppose the argument there is if you can play Knight D2 and F3, then even if Black eventually gets C5 in, it might not be the big deal, but it, it's going to be the other one. Okay. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. So oh. this is actually quite rich. Bishop F4 was what I did, and yeah, John played Bishop G7, although I think F6 was a valid move here as well. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that looks uh, that looks sensible. That looks that looks right, really, yeah. to do Bishop that. Bishop came back from dark squares somehow. Yeah. Okay, but Bishop E7. Oh, Bishop E7. Sorry, Bishop E7. Yeah, Bishop G7 is, is definitely less good than just, uh, yeah, the mighty. Uh, also, also, all the time I would... What I had actually prepared was that if white takes a uh, black takes on b3, then I do get sufficient pressure against c6. Uh, yeah, yeah. Be a little better, I think. Yeah. So I think some of the lines are probably a little bit broad, but white always has something to play with. Yeah, yeah. So I had that much trouble. So rook c1, you played i, played f6 now, and h4. Yeah, h4. Ahead of your time. Well, I think h4 is not a bad move at all, because it's sort of a mixture of aggression and prophylaxis. I sort of have, you know, in the game, H5 later became a, a fairly useful idea. But at this point, stopping D5 is at least part of the plan. Yeah, yeah. And very specifically, I was looking, I thought that, you know, King F6, King F7 might well be where Black really wants to put his king. And in this position, I checked that Queen takes D5 and Rook C7 is actually pretty nasty. Ah, okay, yeah, yeah. Let's just show that line. Uh, so it takes. Think of, yeah, it takes, takes Rook C7, and then, okay, he stops Bishop D6 with Rook D8. But then I had the idea of playing G4, G5. Is, uh, ah, very nice. Uh, very nice. Sort of make something of H4. Yeah, very nice. And this position is just, yeah, pretty nice to wind up. Yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, as usual these days, when you go back and look at it at the end, it's not as exciting as if you wouldn't have worked the time. <laughs> what do they know about it? <laughs> exactly. What do they know? <laughs> so, um, so yeah. John, John went bishop d7 just to cover that. And queen e3. Well, I think at some point you realise that you don't want to be offering the spin stake forever. Yeah. Probably like we're going to take it. Queen e3 feels like, yeah, we're covering c5, but it's all right, not the king side. But, you know, we do reach the position in a few moves time where I, I don't actually any long. Would you want to play the game? I was feeling pretty optimistic. I, I liked my position, but now I think it's actually pretty well balanced. Okay, yeah, yeah. But, you know, in chess in general, I think if you're going to have a fault, overestimating your position is probably one of the best faults. Definitely, yeah. definitely, yeah, yeah. So, rook c8, he played, and rook c3. Ah. And rook c3. So just uh, going to double up on the c file and prevent c6 to c5. Yeah. Indeed. Castles, okay. Yeah, I think when I wrote my notes originally, I thought king f7 was probably a better move here than castles, but the end is now is it different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think they're both broadly. Different. Yeah, yeah. King f seven feels a bit more natural, really. But yeah, yeah. It's uh, but yeah. No, castles can't be uh, can't be bad. Yeah, yeah. Rookie eight, and. It's interesting because again, the engine doesn't really dislike rookie eight, but I suspect. But my feeling at the time was that that wasn't quite right because it actually cut his bishop off from defense to the king side. Bishop e8 felt like... Oh, yeah, okay. I think it's sort of, in terms of connecting pieces to both sides of the board, yeah. I'm not sure that's quite... So maybe rook d8 was... Uh... I think rook d8 was probably stronger. Just to keep bishop e8 is not when you need it. Yeah, that seems, that, that seems, like, a, that seems very, uh, like a good idea, actually. So rook e8, and now rook c1, pawn sacrifice. Yeah, sacrifice number one. Okay, this one. Yes, can he take? Yeah. Well, we'll find out because he did. <laughs> 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 well, I think it's that in this position. You kind of, you're desperate to play C5, and if your opponent is giving something up in order to stop it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You're almost morally obliged to test. <laughs> I suspect that if Black just fiddles or cobbles or whatever, as John Phil would say, that he's actually doing slightly worse. But um, it's not so easy to do, probably. No, it's not. I mean, yeah, it's not pleasant to do. It's not really what you want to. Uh... Yes. Yeah. Nah. Yes, anyway, I sort of was determined to show H4 wasn't just about profit. H5. In we go. And he went queen back to D5. That is supremely natural. So what did you do here? Oh, this is where it starts getting exciting, isn't it? It's been thrilling already, Matthew, but yes. <laughs> takes, takes. Uh, there's some action now. Okay, so I mean, I kind of think his main asset is the bishop pair and his main weakness is the dark square, so you at least take a look <laughs> at trying to exchange off his bishop. Rook c5. Oh, sacrifice. Sacrifice number two. Takes, takes, and queen d6 he played. Yeah, queen a2 is possible, but I think that I, I have sort of some aggressive resources in that case as well. I, um, would, I would have thought so. Starting okay. with queen, queen d3 maybe? Yeah, I think it's queen d3. Just stop that queen from, uh, from getting back through uh, b1, f5. Yeah. And this yeah, looks... King yeah, F7. I think then will be similar to the game, not, not better for black then. Yeah, okay, because you can just, uh, uh, he's, I can try and avoid it, I suppose, from Queen T6. Yeah, but you're, you're happy with this. I'm happy. You're, you're happy to go for this. It's, um, uh, yeah, but I could imagine maybe Queen A2 would be, uh, would be a good defence. Yeah, I don't know, you've got to see, you've got, you would have had to have seen quite a bit, really, to, uh, to make that choice, so it's uh, not an easy... Yeah, well, I think I needed to see a fair bit to... Because you know, I was a bit worried about Queen A2 at the time, and I spent quite a bit of time on it. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah, of course, Queen D6 looked away from that. Okay, and now... Queen D3. Yeah, this is the kind of moment... Yeah, this is the kind of moment where I think he's really missing Yeah, you're right. Okay, it's very concrete, and I think he was missing it in general, but, you know... 
Yeah, yeah. 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 In a, in a, is an illustration of how that bishop actually stopping his position. Yeah. So, yeah, he's got a bit of a problem with this g6. So he went, um, yeah, he went king f7. We've also got... King h7 is rook h5. Oh, very nice. And bishop somewhere will be pretty strong. Yeah. Yeah. This is powerful. I don't think he has a, a square which doesn't lose a queen. No, no. He can only move to dark, can't he, really? Yeah. So, yeah, that's beautiful. And uh, what do we have? We have also had F5 as well. Yeah, F5 is, F5 is interesting because I think at the time I thought kind of um, knight e5 and that's it. I yeah. Think in my head it was knight e5 followed by queen b3 and yeah. that worked strong for black. But, you know, the engine in all its splendor wants to carry on here with rook fd8. Still opening up the bishop e8. Oh, okay, yeah. And actually, it's not as easy as I uh, as it sort of seems it might be at the time. Okay, yeah, yeah. I guess maybe yeah. I guess you you take on g6. I take on g6, yeah. And um, I think yeah. Oh no, I mean you know White's attack is is pretty strong. But yeah. I have to find e5 here. Oh, okay, yeah. Okay, I see. Okay, so this sort of uh, <laughs> this sort of defense, yeah, yeah. This is like this is what it's like when you go through your games years later with the advance of engines. Indeed. But why is at least better at the end of all this? So yeah, yeah, I'm not surprised. E5. Concept, Maybe queen, you know, queen g3 next, I guess. Yeah. Ah, this looks very strong. Queen g3, king h7. I think. Oh. A gather in that moment. Why it has to um, play bishop g5 and queen h4 second material. It's still like a bit Good lord. Now. Yeah, it, feel, it does. It does feels all, all wrong, doesn't it? Really, but uh, yeah, okay. Oh, it looks very strong, though. Oh, yeah, you even. At least you get the piece back. Yeah, and you're cutting off this rook on c8, so that's that is very strong. But my goodness, yeah, yeah, just shows just how uh, any position, any position, these engines can find well, amazing. Five, I didn't think that much about f5. Yeah, okay, yeah. It is, it is the, the least bad option at this point. Yeah. He played a, another very natural move, King F7, and this gave you a chance to display your tactical talent. Ninety-five check. It's very nice, very nice, very nice blow. Third sacrifice. Indeed, takes check. King G8. Obviously, uh, King E7 is Bishop G5 mate. What? <laughs> So king f7, king g8, and queen f6. Yeah, it's a tough one to defend this one. He went rook e7. Yeah, just queen e7. What are we doing? We're taking with check. I think we're taking and just bishop g5. Yeah, this is the uh, the killer with bishop f6 coming in. Indeed. So he went rook e7. Queen g6 check, king h8. Queen f6, Russian repetition, and uh, and bishop f8. This was really nice, actually. I thought uh, I like this very much. Just this, how all this, uh, all black's pieces are so constricted, you know. And uh, you can just um, he gets the opportunity to kill your massive bishop, and still, it's it's wonderful for you. It's very yeah, nice. It's not, best, it's not the best move, but it's kind of nice. Like, what I like about it is that his position would be much better without the feet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So black took on f8, queen takes f8, and uh, yeah, this rook on e7 pins to the queen on d6, and uh, yeah, this rook on c5 is ready to take on e5 or come to c3. And this queen can't move. No, it's it. Yeah, it's amazing, huh? It's a really, uh, it's very unusual. I don't think I've. Uh... Can't move because of the queen, and the queen can't move because of the rook. So you have to move the bishop. Exactly, move the bishop, and then rook c three. Now you don't take on e five because uh, the bishop's covering h five, but rook h rook c three, and this is going to be curtains. Check. Ah, and he resigned there. King g5, queen f6, king g4, and rook h4, checkmate. Very nice. That's a great game. Yeah, that's a great... I remembered it, actually. Uh, I remember seeing this one at the time. 
You don't yeah. for, you don't forget a move like rook c5. That's uh, I remember seeing this one, uh, seeing seeing it from this position. So uh, it's uh, no really great. I mean, um, uh, yeah, I mean, I think Black needed to to find some quite unusual moves to defend every time. You know, queen. I, I think uh, you know, queen a2 would have been probably a better defense, and then uh, and then later, you know, f5. But these are, yeah, that makes it a, a very yeah, it makes a very difficult defense when you have to find, you know, really unnatural moves, you know, putting your queen away from your king or uh, or weakening the squares you've been trying to control all the game, you know. So uh, I can understand why um, why uh, why John played the moves he did, you know. But uh, but these, uh, yeah, really, really stunning, really, uh, really excellent. Because so, actually you're attacking with not that many pieces, you know, but they're just so beautifully coordinated that... Uh, yeah, well, it's sort of underlying dark feathers, but it's all of luck. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's true. That's true. It's ah, uh... oh, fantastic, Peter. Well, thanks very much for showing us that game. Great to see uh, to see that one again. And um, well, you know, maybe one time we'll be able to meet again over the board. Yeah, it will be nice. Will be nice. I'm I'm missing it a little bit. I have to I say. Like it might be some time away. Yeah, I think so too. It's, uh, but we'll enjoy it all the more when we uh, when we see it. Okay, thanks very much, Peter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.